So uh, we're looking at Daniel chapter 4. You've got it there in your Bibles, and hopefully you've got a handout which shows you where we're going and if you want to take some notes as well. Uh, John has prayed. Um, So I want to ask us, um, I imagine that all of us at some stage or other in our lives have said, ask the question, God, what is going on? You know, isn't our world um, so chaotic at the moment? You have powerful rulers posturing to one another. We have wicked leaders exploiting their people. We have God hating leaders persecuting God's people. Gods, why aren't you acting? I mean, so imagine a, uh, a Christian in Afghanistan at the moment. So in fact, you don't actually have to imagine one. I've got a, a real-life example. Um, a, a lady called Gulshan in Afghanistan. As you know, the Taliban have taken over again. And now they are going door-to-door, systematically trying to hunt out Christians. And if they find one, they execute them on the spot. We ask, maybe even more than them, God, can't you do something about it? In this country, right, nowhere near as extreme, nowhere near as as bad, but freedom of speech does seem to be gradually eroding, and people even now, and certainly probably not in the too distant future, they face the prospect of losing job, of a massive social media backlash, possibly facing prison for standing on the truth of God's words. God, why not intervene? Now Daniel 4 isn't going to answer all those questions. But it is going to help and give us a really good starting point and going to give us something to stand on and hold on to. We're going to go through the, the chapter. I've kind of given the outline of it there on, on your sheets. We're going to stop and notice some kind of important things along the way, and then we're going to come back at the end to really draw the thing together and think about two big implications for us uh, as a church family today. Um, so first off, Daniel, uh, chapter 4, uh, you can see there we're going to start with Nebuchadnezzar's letter of praise. Please do look with me at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Let's pause there a second. King Nebuchadnezzar here is writing a letter. He's writing a letter to all of his people, all nations, peoples, languages, and he is writing, and that includes, um, the, he's writing to God's people, the Israelites, who he had utterly defeated. He defeated them and he destroyed them. And yet in this letter, see what he now says about the God that it seems like he's conquered. Verse 3, he says, How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. This is the king who's killed or carried off all of God's people. As a sign of utter disrespect and total victory, he's carried away some of the items from the uh, Jewish temple, and he brought them into the temple of his gods. In chapter 3, we saw that he had thrown the faithful Israelites into a fiery burning furnace. And here he is, talking about the Most High, and saying how great are his signs. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. What gets him to this point? What happens that the king of all the earth would say this about God's? Well, it's all to do with what we find, as he now explains in this letter. And so now from verse 4, we move on into the dream. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. 
I saw a dream that made me terrified. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. Nebuchadnezzar there, he, life is kushti. Right, home life, work life, things are going well. This is a time of comfort and peace, prosperity. Until he has this dream and he's alarmed. And we remember that Nebuchadnezzar was a deeply religious man. And so he did what deeply religious men of those days did and what you've seen him do before, verse 6. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, and the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my gods, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream. We'll come to it in a second. Now, after what we've seen, particularly back in chapter 2, why Nebuchadnezzar's bothered bothered with all these other um, so-called religious advisors, we don't know. But they come in, and once again, they fail to be able to give an interpretation, even though this time he tells them what he dreamt. But then Daniel does come in and that great description of there, in, in whom the spirit of the holy gods. And what is uh, this dream where he says, saying, verse 9, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know, here it is again, that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in the bed were these. And here's the dream. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to heaven. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Right, here's his dream, quite impressive, isn't it? This is just a picture of a Monday tree. But a big tree, far bigger than this one, one that has grown and has spread to the ends of the earth, one that feeds all the the creatures under it and protects them and all these things. It's a lovely picture. Nebuchadnezzar, why are you frightened? This is great. Well, we read on, verse 13. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven, most likely an angel. Verse 14, he proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Okay. This is what's got him scared. Verse 15. But leave the stump of its root in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the fields. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let Let his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and, a, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. I just want to kind of pause and slow down a little bit here. Verse 17 is key. The, sen- the sentence is, By the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Here you get these these watchers, they're speaking for God and he tells them what is going to come to pass, that it's going to be chopped down, that the branch is going to remain, but actually this fearful, terrible thing, terrible thing is going to happen to him. He's going to lose his mind. He's going to become like the beasts of the earth. Why is this happening? Verse 17, we're all told. This is happening 
to the end that the living, everyone, may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. It's key, I've put this on your talk notes right up the top there. We find very, very similar words twice more through the chapter. Indeed, uh, once at the end of each of the main sections of this passage, we find these same words. Nebuchadnezzar, he needs to know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of men and that he gives them to whoever he likes. Nebuchadnezzar needs to know that's not just him, the living, us. We know, need to know that. Verse 18 this dream, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation but you are able for the spirit of the holy gods is in you and so the interpretation Just as Nebuchadnezzar was alarmed when he had this dream, well, so Daniel is alarmed too, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lords, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. Now some people here think that um, Daniel is is kind of just trying to be tactful here. I think, the impression I get is that he genuinely cared. He genuinely cared about King Nebuchadnezzar, and we'll see uh, why I think that a little bit later on. But he says this is so terrible that he, he has affected himself and he doesn't want this to come to pass on Nebuchadnezzar but, but actually on his enemies. But anyway, Daniel retells the, uh, the dream with, with one key detail um, in there. Did you see it? Um, and he says, it is you. First, beginning of verse 22. It is you, O king. This tree, this vision that you had, it is you. You, O king. You, O king, who is the most powerful king on all the earth. The most powerful king of the most powerful kingdom. Yes, you are the king of all the earth, but this is going to come to pass. And then he gives the interpretation, verse 24. Uh, sorry, we missed one there. Where do we get to? Thank you. 19. Let me read from verse 20. There you go. The, the tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all under which beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till the seven periods of time pass over him. Sorry, there we go. Daniel retells this dream but with that one important point. And now he gives the interpretation. Verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree, not of king of the earth, it is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King that you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know, here it is again, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. Here's the second occurrence. The first one is so that all the living, now it's got specific, you Nebuchadnezzar, this is happening until you know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of men and gives them to whoever he likes. It's reinforced in verse 26. And as it was commanded, 
Uh, to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know, uh, sorry, until the time that you know that heaven rules. This is going to happen until heaven rules. But there is this note of hope. This tree stump remains. And while there is a tree stump, there is hope for a tree. And here in verse 27 is is why I think that Daniel genuinely cares. Because he goes beyond Nebuchadnezzar's request. Okay, here David could stop and slip away into the background. But he doesn't. At risk to his own life, he goes on in verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. In the Old Testament, I was so helped when I first came to, to realise this, that the Old Testament prophecies weren't simply only a prediction of the future. It wasn't simply a case that God, through a prophet, said that this is going to come to pass. These prophecies were given as warnings that if you carry on living the way you are living, rejecting God as you are rejecting him, then this will come to pass. Quite often that was what's going on. But these prophecies were given as a warning. And so here too with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, if you keep acting like this, this is what is going to happen. But this prophecy has come as a warning to you to change your ways. And so Daniel calls him to change his ways. These sins here, perhaps particular to Nebuchadnezzar himself personally, or perhaps a particular danger for kings uh, as a whole. But he calls them to show mercy to the oppressed. Uh, and to practice righteousness and showing mercy to the oppressed. And can I just very, very briefly just offer a little encouragement to, to you if you're helping a holiday, woo, holiday club, um, uh, if you're helping a holiday club this week, just imagine Daniel's situation here. It is a pretty terrifying thing for him. He's at great risk to himself, but he boldly shares God's words and calls him to change. And I also encourage you that at Holiday Club, that is what you are doing this week. It is scary sometimes. There can be risk to ourselves as we seek to share all of God's word with people and call them to change their ways. And yet here we see Daniel's compassion for the king and his truthfulness. And would that characterize us as the church family this week? compassionate and truthful as we seek to share Jesus with the children and their parents caring more about someone's eternal soul than our own current safety and security but how did Nebuchadnezzar respond to this well we we don't know too much but what is interesting is we now have this 12 month gap in the story It could have been that this was a time of testing to see whether Nebuchadnezzar was going to change his ways. It could have been a sign that actually he did seek to change his ways for a little while. But either way, we have this 12-month gap. And then we move on to the dream's fulfillment. We pick up in verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking around on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. So there he is, this is just an artistic impression of what the city might have been. But Babylon would have been an incredibly impressive city. It contains Hanging Gardens, one of the ancient seven wonders of the world. And there he is, walking on the roof, looking around, surveying it all. And that pride that has so often been evident in him, once again surfaces. He's clearly not quite learnt his lesson. And so verse 30... And the king answered and said, Is this, sorry, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal, resi- um, uh, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And he goes on, verse 31, While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O king Nebuchadnezzar, 
To you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know, here it is again, (coughs) the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers and his nails were like birds' claws. Can I have a glass of water? Cheers, thanks. But did, there, did you see that third occurrence of that key sentence there? Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Ray. It's a terrifying picture, isn't it? Verse 33. Here this mighty king loses his mind and crawls around like one of the beasts of the field, eating grass. Apparently there is a condition called boanthropy, where this happens, where people think that they are one, like a wild animal. But here this falls upon King Nebuchadnezzar. But this isn't the end. Because see what he recognises about God and himself as he again returns to finish in praise. Verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? And then we have yet another remarkable change in circumstances. Verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my sorry, for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of Heaven. For all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. So Nebuchadnezzar comes full circle and indeed responds, um, <coughs> excuse me, results in him praising God. Sorry, Ray, could I have another one, please? Thank you. What does this all mean for us? Incredible visions, incredible happenings of a king a long time ago. But what does it mean for us? Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Two big implications for us. Number one, be confident and comforted that God rules the kingdoms of men and establishes whoever he likes to rule them. Be confident and comforted. Remember that the people who were first hearing this letter. Can you imagine that? You're God's people in exile. You've been beaten by King Nebuchadnezzar. You're living under his power and authority, exploited and subjected by him for him. And then he writes a letter to you and says... God is the God of gods. He is the one whose kingdom lasts forever. The first readers of this book, again, they'd come out of exile, but they were still very much under the power of foreign kings. And they are reading this, and they are reading this again, verse 17 and all those other verses, so that we may know that God is the king, excuse me, that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. 
imagine those first readers reading this and hearing that, that despite appearances, God is the one who is the most high, ruling over all. Think of the, the confidence and the comfort that would have brought them. That's what's happening um, here. The Jews in exile might look like these other gods of one, but no, God is the one who is ruling over them all. And it's exactly the same today. Boris Johnson, Biden, Putin, King John Un, you know, all put in place ultimately by God. I'm sure North Korean Christians sometimes wonder why. As I said at the meeting, there, there are no easy answers, but the message of Daniel chapter 4 is beyond doubt that God is sovereign. He has set them up. And just as he has set them up in a heartbeat, he can bring them down. And as we've seen before, um, particularly in chapter 2, we're reminded of again here that the kingdoms of the earth are but temporary. In verse 34, the second half, we find this phrase that we also found at the beginning as well. But we read again that his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. God has established his king forever. He has set up in the Lord Jesus the king who will rule for all time. The reason I put verse 17 on your handouts is because that's the kind of fullest um, explanation of that verse. And I love that little phrase at the end. Do you see that? We get the, the same words that come the three times, but at the end you get, in verse 17, you get, and sets over it the lowliest of men. Intriguing little phrase, that. In my mind immediately goes back to Philippians chapter 2 that we looked at as a church family just before Christmas. And we're reminded actually that Jesus... He left his glory in heaven and humbled himself, becoming a man. And not just becoming a man, but becoming a servant. Not just a servant, but a servant who came to die. And yet he is exalted, even the lowliest, to be king forever. And so, dear friends, let's don't be overly impressed by our leaders and their governments. They're just interim arrangements before the Lord Jesus fully and finally takes his throne forever. And when we're standing on the truth of God's words, and it's getting riskier to do so, be, com- be confident, and therefore be comforted, that it is the Most High who rules the kings of men and gives them to whoever he likes. That's the first implication. And that was very much specifically for, for God's people. But again in verse 17 we're reminded that these things are happening so that the living, everyone, would know this too. We see again Nebuchadnezzar himself writes to all people, nations and languages. So the second big implication for us is to be humble before the sovereign God of all. This is all happening so that that Nebuchadnezzar and we would know that. Why did this happen? Well, it's because Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that. He thought that his gods had conquered all, and he himself had conquered all. He needed to know that. And when did, this all, when did these terrible events stop for him? It's when he acknowledged God for who he is. And indeed, see the final words from Nebuchadnezzar's mouth again, verse 30, uh, 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of Heaven, for just as, his work, just as his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. That was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. He was walking in pride, but he was indeed humbled. And God taught him that lesson in the most dramatic of ways. Again, do we need to remember our place before God at the moment? You know, we love to do the same as Nebuchadnezzar, just on much smaller scales. But we love to set ourselves up as little kings and queens of our own life, thinking that we are the ones in control and in charge. We pay little, if any, attention to God, give no recognition or thanks for the good things that he's given, 
Don't let him have any say over lives. It's all too easy. Well, the second big application of this is humble yourself. Humble yourself before the sovereign, most high gods. Humble yourself before King Jesus, who rules the throne for, on the throne forever. He is the King of Heaven, who is worthy of submitting to. So here, this dream for Nebuchadnezzar, this great warning for him in order to bring comfort, confidence and comfort to God's people and as a warning to those who aren't yet. That God, the Most High, is the one who rules over the kingdoms of men and gives them to whoever he pleases. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your revelation of yourself to King Nebuchadnezzar. We thank you for that revelation of yourself to us. You are indeed, we want to come before you and lift you up as the Most High, the King of Heaven, the one who rules over everything on earth. Please give us a greater confidence in that truth and please comfort us and indeed our brothers and sisters across the world with it as well. Please, Father, keep us humble before you as we acknowledge and recognise who you are. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.